Chapter 47 of A Short History of the World by H. G. Wells Recalcitrant Princes and the Great Schism One very great weakness of the Roman Church in its struggle to secure the headship of all Christendom was the manner in which the Pope was chosen. If indeed the papacy was to achieve its manifest ambition and establish one rule and one peace throughout Christendom, then it was vitally necessary that it should have a strong, steady, and continuous direction. In those great days of its opportunity, it needed before all things that the popes, when they took office, should be able men in the prime of life, that each should have his successor designate, with whom he could discuss, the policy of the Church, and that the forms and processes of election should be clear definite, unalterable, and unassailable. Unhappily none of these things obtained. It was not even clear who could vote in the election of a pope, nor whether the Byzantine or Holy Roman Emperor had a voice in the matter. That very great papal statesman Hildebrand, Pope Gregory the Seventh, 1073-1085, did much to regularize the election. He confined the votes to the Roman cardinals, and he reduced the emperor's share to a formula of assent conceded to him by the church. But he made no provision for a successor designate, and he left it possible for the disputes of the cardinals to keep the see vacant, as in some cases it was kept vacant, for a year or more. The consequences of this want of firm definition are to be seen in the whole history of the papacy up to the 16th century. From quite early times onward, there were disputed elections, and two or more men each claiming to be pope. The church would then be subjected to the indignity of going to the emperor or some other outside arbiter to settle the dispute, and the career of every one of the great popes ended in a note of interrogation. At his death, the church might be left headless, and as ineffective as a decapitated body. Or he might be replaced by some old rival, eager only to discredit and undo his work. Or some enfeebled old man, tottering on the brink of the grave, might succeed him. It was inevitable that this peculiar weakness of the papal organization should attract the interference of the various German princes, the French king, and the Norman and French kings who ruled in England, that they should all try to influence the elections, and have a pope in their own interest established in the Lateran palace at Rome. And the more powerful and important the pope became in European affairs, the more urgent did these interventions become. Under the circumstances it is no great wonder that many of the popes were weak and futile. The astonishing thing is that many of them were able and courageous men. One of the most vigorous and interesting of the popes of this great period was Innocent III, 1198 to 1216, who was so fortunate as to become pope before he was thirty-eight. He and his successors were pitted against an even more interesting personality the Emperor Frederick II, Stupor Mundi he was called, the wonder of the world. The struggle of this monarch against Rome is a turning place in history. In the end, Rome defeated him and destroyed his dynasty, but he left the prestige of the church and pope so badly wounded that its wounds festered and led to its decay. Frederick was the son of the Emperor Henry VI, and his mother was the daughter of Roger I, the Norman King of Sicily. He inherited this kingdom in 1198, when he was a child of four years. Innocent III had been made his guardian. Sicily in those days had been but recently conquered by the Normans. The court was half oriental and full of highly educated Arabs and some of these were associated in the education of the young king. No doubt they were at some pains to make their point of view clear to him. 
he got a Muslim view of Christianity, as well as a Christian view of Islam, and the unhappy result of this double system of instruction was a view, exceptional in the age of faith, that all religions were impostures. He talked freely on the subject. His heresies and blasphemies are on record. As the young man grew up, he found himself in conflict with his guardian. Innocent the Third wanted altogether too much from his ward. When the opportunity came for Frederick to succeed as emperor, the Pope intervened with conditions. Frederick must promise to put down heresy in Germany with a strong hand. Moreover, he must relinquish his crown in Sicily and South Italy, because otherwise he would be too strong for the Pope. And the German clergy were to be freed from all taxation. Frederick agreed, but with no intention of keeping his word. The Pope had already induced the French king to make war upon his own subjects in France, the cruel and bloody crusade against the Waldenses. He wanted Frederick to do the same thing in Germany. But Frederick being far more of a heretic than any of the simple pietists who had incurred the Pope's animosity, lacked the crusading impulse. And when Innocent urged him to crusade against the Moslem and recover Jerusalem, he was equally ready to promise and equally slack in his performance. Having secured the imperial crown, Frederick II stayed in Sicily, which he greatly preferred to Germany as a residence, and did nothing to redeem any of his promises to Innocent III, who died baffled in 1216. Honorius III, who succeeded Innocent, could do no better with Frederick, and Gregory the Ninth. 1227, came to the papal throne evidently resolved to settle accounts with this young man at any cost. He excommunicated him. Frederick II was denied all the comforts of religion. In the half-Arab court of Sicily, this produced singularly little discomfort. And also the Pope addressed a public letter to the Emperor, reciting his vices, which were indisputable, his heresies, and his general misconduct. To this, Frederick replied in a document of diabolical ability. It was addressed to all the princes of Europe, and it made the first clear statement of the issue between the Pope and the princes. He made a shattering attack upon the manifest ambition of the Pope to become the absolute ruler of all Europe. He suggested a union of princes against this usurpation, he directed the attention of the princes specifically to the wealth of the church. Having fired off this deadly missile, Frederick resolved to perform his twelve-year-old promise and go upon a crusade. This was the Sixth Crusade, 1228. It was as a crusade farcical. Frederick II went to Egypt and met and discussed affairs with the sultan. These two gentlemen both of skeptical opinions, exchanged congenial views, made a commercial convention to their mutual advantage, and agreed to transfer Jerusalem to Frederick. This indeed was a new sort of crusade, a crusade by private treaty. Here was no blood splashing the conqueror, no weeping with excess of joy. As this astonishing crusader was an excommunicated man, he had to be content with a purely secular coronation as king of Jerusalem, taking the crown from the altar with his own hand, for all the clergy were bound to shun him. He then returned to Italy, chased the papal armies which had invaded his dominions back to their own territories, and obliged the Pope to grant him absolution from his excommunication. So a prince might treat the Pope in the thirteenth century, and there was now no storm of popular indignation to avenge him. Those days were past. In 1239, Gregory IX resumed his struggle with Frederick, excommunicated him for a second time, and renewed that warfare of public abuse in which the papacy had already suffered severely. 
The controversy was revived after Gregory the Ninth was dead, when Innocent the Fourth was Pope, and again a devastating letter, which men were bound to remember, was written by Frederick against the Church. He denounced the pride and irreligion of the clergy, and ascribed all the corruptions of the time to their pride and wealth. He proposed to his fellow princes a general confiscation of church property for the good of the church. It was a suggestion that never afterwards left the imagination of the European princes. We will not go on to tell of his last years. The particular events of his life are far less significant than its general atmosphere. It is possible to piece together something of his court life in Sicily. He was luxurious in his way of living, and fond of beautiful things. He is described as licentious, but it is clear that he was a man of very effectual curiosity and inquiry. He gathered Jewish and Moslem as well as Christian philosophers at his court, and he did much to irrigate the Italian mind with Saracenic influences. Through him, the Arabic numerals and algebra were introduced to Christian students, and among other philosophers at his court was Michael Scott, who translated portions of Aristotle and the commentaries thereon of the great Arab philosopher Averroes of Cordoba. In 1224, Frederick founded the University of Naples, and he enlarged and enriched the great medical school at Salerno University. He also founded a zoological garden. He left a book on hawking, which shows him to have been an acute observer of the habits of birds, and he was one of the first Italians to write Italian verse. Italian poetry was indeed born at his court. He has been called, by an able writer, the first of the moderns, and the phrase expresses aptly the unprejudiced detachment of his intellectual side. A still more striking intimation of the decay of the living and sustaining forces of the papacy appeared when presently the popes came into conflict with the growing power of the French king. During the lifetime of the Emperor Frederick II, Germany fell into disunion, and the French king began to play the role of guard, supporter, and rival to the Pope, that had hitherto fallen to the Hohenstaufen emperors. A series of Popes pursued the policy of supporting the French monarchs. French princes were established in the kingdoms of Sicily and Naples, with the support and approval of Rome, and the French kings saw before them the possibility of restoring and ruling the empire of Charlemagne. When, however, the German interregnum after the death of Frederick II, the last of the Hohenstaufens, came to all end, and Rudolf of Habsburg was elected first Habsburg Emperor, 1273. The policy of Rome began to fluctuate between France and Germany, wearing about with the sympathies of each successive pope. In the East, in 1261, the Greeks recaptured Constantinople from the Latin emperors, and the founder of the new Greek dynasty, Michael Paleologus, Michael VIII, after some unreal tentatives of reconciliation with the Pope, broke away from the Roman communion altogether, and with that, and the fall of the Latin kingdoms in Asia, the eastward ascendancy of the Popes came to an end. In 1294, Boniface VIII became Pope. He was an Italian, hostile to the French, and full of a sense of the great traditions and missions of Rome. For a time he carried things with a high hand. In 1300 he held a jubilee, and a vast multitude of pilgrims assembled in Rome. So great was the influx of money into the papal treasury, that two assistants were kept busy with the rakes collecting the offerings that were deposited at the tomb of St. Peter. But this festival was a delusive triumph. Boniface came into conflict with the French king in 1302, and in 1303, as he was about to pronounce sentence of excommunication against that monarch, he was surprised 
and arrested in his own ancestral palace at Anagni by Guillemy de Nogaret. This agent from the French king forced an entrance into the palace, made his way into the bedroom of the frightened pope, he was lying in bed with a cross in his hands, and heaped threats and insults upon him. The pope was liberated a day or so later by the townspeople, and returned to Rome, but there he was seized upon and again made prisoner by the Orsini family, and in a few weeks' time the shocked and disillusioned old man died a prisoner in their hands. The people of Anagni did resent the first outrage, and rose against Nogaret to liberate Boniface, but then Anagni was the Pope's native town. The important point to note is that the French king, in this rough treatment of the head of Christendom, was acting with the full approval of his people. He had summoned a council of the three estates of France, lords, church, and commons, and gained their consent before proceeding to extremities. Neither in Italy, Germany, nor England was there the slightest general manifestation of disapproval at this free handling of the sovereign pontiff. The idea of Christendom had decayed until its power over the minds of men had gone. Throughout the fourteenth century the papacy did nothing to recover its moral sway. The next pope elected Clement V, but a Frenchman, the choice of King Philip of France. He never came to Rome. He set up his court in the town of Avignon, which then belonged not to France but to the papal see, though embedded in French territory, and there his successors remained until 1377, when Pope Gregory XI returned to the Vatican Palace in Rome. But Gregory XI did not take the sympathies of the whole church with him. Many of the cardinals were of French origin, and their habits and associations were rooted deep at Avignon. When in 1378 Gregory XI died, and an Italian, Urban VI, was elected, these dissentient cardinals declared the election invalid, and elected another pope, the antipope Clement VIII. This split is called the Great Schism. The popes remained in Rome, and all the anti-French powers, the emperor, the king of England, Hungary, Poland, and the north of Europe, were loyal to them. The antipopes, on the other hand, continued in Avignon, and were supported by the king of France, his ally, the king of Scotland, Spain, Portugal, and various German princes. Each pope excommunicated and cursed the adherents of his rival, 1378 to 1417. Is it any wonder that presently all over Europe people began to think for themselves in matters of religion? The beginnings of the Franciscans and Dominicans, which we have noted in the preceding chapters, were but two among many of the new forces that were arising in Christendom, either to hold or shatter the Church, as its own wisdom might decide. Those two orders the Church did assimilate and use, though with a little violence in the case of the former. But other forces were more frankly disobedient and critical. A century and a half later came Wycliffe, 1320-1384. He was a learned doctor at Oxford. Quite late in his life he began a series of outspoken criticisms of the corruption of the clergy and the unwisdom of the church. He organized a number of poor priests, the Wycliffeites, to spread his ideas throughout England, and in order that people should judge between the church and himself, he translated the Bible into English. He was a more learned and far abler man than either St. Francis or St. Dominic. He had supporters in high places and a great following among the people. And though Rome raged against him and ordered his imprisonment, he died a free man. But the black and ancient spirit that was leading the Catholic Church to its destruction would not let his bones rest in the grave. 
By a decree of the Council of Constance in 1415, his remains were ordered to be dug up and burned, an order which was carried out by the command of Pope Martin V by Bishop Fleming in 1428. This desecration was not the act of some isolated fanatic, it was the official act of the Church. End of chapter 47